Our story begins 20 years ago. Boris Yeltsin was sworn into office. Jay Leno replaced Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show. And cell phones were really, really big. It was August of 1991, and a 20-year-old computer science student named Linus Torvalds sat down at his computer in Helsinki to post what is now one of the most famous entries in computing history. Hello, everybody out there. I'm doing a free operating system, just a hobby. Won't be anything big and professional like GNU. It probably will never support anything other than AT hard disks, as that's all I have. A well, word of Linux open source project quickly spread around the globe, and developers from all over contributed their code. Linus named his OS kernel Linux and chose a penguin as its mascot after a little incident at the zoo. He soon made a very important decision that would shape Linux's future just as much as the technology. He chose the GPL license. Does anyone know who this person is? Sorry? It's created by a visionary named Richard Stallman. The Linux kernel... Now do you know this person? Or what this person is associated with? Richard Stallman? Anyone? along with the GPL license and other GNU components, revolutionized the computing industry with a few very simple yet very important freedoms. The freedom to use the software for any purpose. The freedom to change the software to suit your needs. The freedom to share the software with your friends and neighbors. And the freedom to share the changes you make. These radical ideas fueled its spread around the world, and somewhat paradoxically, its rise from a hobbyist experiment to the foundation of a large and thriving commercial ecosystem. Companies built businesses around Linux. In 1999, Red Hat's stock tripled as it became the first Linux company to go public. That same year, IBM spent a billion dollars to improve and advertise Linux. Say the name. His name is Linux. Soon, has anyone seen this ad? Linux was knocking out industry heavyweights and fueling the rise of the internet with its free software. In short, Linux revolutionized computing. But whenever something is this disruptive, there's bound to be competitive crossfire. But Linux not only survived, it thrived. Today, the kernel development community numbers in the thousands, with hundreds of companies collaborating on Linux development. Every three months, another version of Linux is released. So, where is Linux today? Running in 75% of stock exchanges worldwide, and powering the servers that deliver Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, eBay, and Google. You use Linux literally every time you surf the internet. It's in your phone, in your TV, running 95% of supercomputers, and in many of the devices you use every day. Linux is everywhere. And the Helsinki-based programmer who started it all? He orchestrates this worldwide army of developers from his home office in Portland, Oregon, as a fellow at the Linux Foundation. As we celebrate 20 years of Linux, we can all see ourselves in its story. Thank you for being a part of its first 20 years. Does anyone know where Helsinki is? Which country is Helsinki? I think it's Finland. I'll have to confirm. Helsinki. Yeah, it's in Finland. So what we'll do today is to run some very basic commands. And today I'm also running a virtual machine, so even though I hate running it.
is this clear to everyone we'll be running some very basic commands to get a, a slight grip on the command line in ubuntu and linux so i'll start off with asking you like what what are some of the commands you already know so let's talk about does anyone know how we how we can look at the current path uh, let's say you can also do man pwd so it shows that it prints the name of the current or the working directory so often times you are in some path like in windows you are in some folder in some folder in some folder so you want to know the exact path in windows you might do a right click and uh, you know find out that information or you could look at the status bar if you're in the command line it's fairly easy if you just run the pwd command again it has various other uh, options also let's go to desktop it has so what what command did i type here ls so cd to move uh, to 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 change the directory so i was at my home folder so for the windows folks let's say i am in c users uh, your name i want to move to the desktop c users name slash desktop so this is equivalent of that so i did a, a cd desktop you do man cd oops man oops okay at least for mkd I, uh, I i don't know why it doesn't have a manual entry for uh, cd sorry info cd oh okay no many item cd in node let off yeah i don't know uh, so after changing the directory we moved to the desktop we wanted to view the contents of the desktop so i wrote ls and if this is getting ugly let me use the clear command so clear is going to clear the console and let me do an ls again so it's showing me different different types of uh, files uh, do, you, do you know why some of these are in a different color like common.hcp.c io.c are all in white the other ones are in a tinge of blue are these hidden files? No, these are not hidden files. These are actually executable files. So the equivalent uh, in Windows, so this is similar to .exe. So you could just execute that. You cannot execute these, uh, let's say, if, so, so in Unix or uh, Linux, you execute uh, executables by writing dot slash and giving the current path. So if I write cpu.c, so it, it won't run because it's not an executable. But if I am to write, yeah, so it, it's of the type so this program runs so executables are one are the programs which you can directly execute whereas cpu.c in this case is just a regular c file uh, let's say we are in desktop we want to create uh, a new folder so so those who've used windows uh, and have used command prompt how do you create a new folder make dire or mkdir or something on that lines right so we have command called mkdir and of course if i don't give the name of a directory it's going to say that it's missing an operand so let's me create a directory called temp so now if i'm, I'm still in desktop if i do an ls i see temp and temp is now of, of another different color so now we can see a file a regular file, an executable file, and a folder. All three of them are in a different color. Let's say I now want to use the ls command again, with, but I want to see more details about it. Let's say I want to see the sizes of all of these files. So I'll do a man ls. Oh, by the way, please stop me in between if you're not getting anything, especially those who have never run Linux. You want, if you want me to go slow, shoot, shoot me. Don't shoot me literally. Like, just, just shoot your hand up and let me, uh, and let me know if, if you're having any difficulty. Yeah. 
right yeah then it executes so okay so what what, what is the executable here name any executable here okay make mem.chs is an executable we uh, okay maybe it's so it it is an executable but this is an executable for os x so it requires csh which is another type of shell you don't need to bother about it yet but it is an executable like mem is an executable and if i give in the argument so it executes whereas we had a mem.c also somewhere yeah so we have a mem.c also which is just your regular uh, c program when well, and, and if those who are like really well versed with uh, linux command line and if you want to like make better use of your time you, you're free to move out so mem.c we're going to compile it to create an executable which uh, in this case was mem so ls by itself is just listing out the names of the files can we do something more to make it more useful so let's look at man ls so it says a list directory contents and uh, description says that information about the files sort entries alphabetically if none of the minus c f t u v s u x nor minus sort is specified uh, mandatory arguments long options are mandatory for short options to uh, minus minus author gives you the author of each file so in case you have multiple users on a system so let's try and see if we get something here Oops, I don't see anything. Oh, with with minus L. So in fact, you are seeing a lot more information at this point of time. So these are various flags which are associated with each file. So each file, the operating system somehow needs to know whether it's an executable or whether it's just a read-write file or whether you can write into it or whether you can just read into it. So do you notice for all the executables, do you see something different compared to the other files? So make mem.csh is an executable, make threads.csh is an executable, mem is an executable, and let's say common.c is common.h is not an executable. So if you look at the flags for this versus the flags for this, do you see any difference? So you see more x. Here. X stands for executable in this case. So it means that there's a flag associated with this file. The operating system maintains this flag and says that this file can be uh, directly executed. So that's why uh, ls it, it's a very useful command. But let's have more fun with ls. So minus h says that it's human readable. So let's see what that does. Uh, no. Okay. So using ls minus l we can see a lot of the attributes we can see the read write permissions we can see uh, the date of creation or last access at this point we don't know whether it's the last access or the date uh, we'll have to read more in the uh, manual and we also see some numbers here 391 834 272 39 523 any idea what this could mean this could this could be the size but in what units most probably it's bytes. So minus uh, H, if you run that, it gives you in a more human interpretable or easier to understand format. So now you see that this shows 4.0K, 4.0K, 
corresponding to 4096 bytes. Now interestingly, this is the folder, this is not a file, temp. So at this point of time, we'll not bother about this, like why this is a folder and why not a file and why, why the folder does all, like also has a size. So we won't bother at this point of time. But none of our files are really big at this point. So maybe we should create a big file. So any suggestions on how I can create, you know, one MB file? So one could be I open up the word editor and I type for the next 40 minutes. I might reach uh, you know, half an MB or so. Other ideas I could copy something from the internet and uh, get something. Any other suggestions? Use? Copy other files. Okay, so wait, which, cop which files do I copy? Okay, where do I find these? So, so in this scenario, what do I do? Where do I copy them from? Okay, but this, all of them are you know, less than maybe one MB or, so, or less than, yeah. yeah, total 72K, it's pretty small. Okay, so one way is to create a C program, dynamically allocate memory. So all of this is a fairly complicated things. Like I think you could do something easier. Open the browser, search Google for an image, download that image. Probably more than one MB, right? So that's how you can get uh, file bigger than one MB. But I am more of a Python lover, so I'll create something in Python. So let's say. Oops, I don't. I have Python 3 installed. It wrote something something into the file. I don't know why it was echoing something. But let's just look at the size of this file. One point four MB, right? So if we were not using the H flag. It's one three nine one nine three two bytes. So that is, does anyone know how to use a calculator on the shell? Like if I were to write, if I were to ask you that, could you convert these uh, bytes into megabytes? Does anyone know the command? So even I don't remember it, but I think it could be BQ. No manual entry for BQ. Yeah, we could use some other command. Like, we'll have to search for it online. Okay, so we've now created a program. Did you notice uh, that I wrote something on the top here? ls start.txt. Uh, generally, ls was giving me, if you just, if I just write ls, I'm seeing a lot of files. If I write ls start.txt, I see only a single entry. Uh, test.txt. Any idea why? Right. So, so we are looking for all the files which are ending with start.txt. 
Now, how do you do this in your regular operating system, like using GUI? So whenever you're using, uh, you know, you're finding files. So this is essentially finding a file by an extension. Minus R also seems pretty useful. So it says that list subdirectories recursively. So what what do you think this will do? Okay, so let's say if I'm in desktop, I have uh, about ten files and one folder. The the folder was uh, temp. What do you expect this to show if I write ls uh, minus R? Right, so, so it says that it shows list all the subdirectories recursively. So if temp has some files also, this will also show all the files in temp. So ls is, and then you see, so it shows that for temp that nothing exists. But let's now create something in temp. So if we go to temp, we see that nothing exists. Uh, how do you create a file? So we could use the touch command, we could, uh, you know, just use a regular ad editor. So how many of us have used the Vim or VI editor? And how many of you have uh, been able to exit without using control Z or, okay, that's great. So the joke goes around that, you know, if you want to type uh, something gibberish very long, so you just handle Vim or VI editor to a, you know, to a novice. They'll try everything to exit from the program. So those who are not getting the joke, you should just try and running a Vim. You, you'll, 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 you'll understand the full joke. Uh, if I write, yeah. So this is how this editor looks like. Let's say if I type something. Now, how do you think I would escape? Like exit, in, in a general editor, how would you exit? Or say, if you type control S, right? If I do control S or command S here, control S does nothing. Command S opens something for the virtual machine for some instance. So it's doing nothing. So it's, this is actually a modal editor. By modal editor means that it has two different modes. One is command mode and the other is the text mode. So the command mode is where you do some of the operations. So you don't need to know all of this. I will like this will not be asked in the exam, just for your information. So I enter into the command mode by pressing escape. Yeah, bad thing happen. Usually bad things can happen when you're running them. For some, for some reason this is hanging. Okay, so we move to the desktop using CD command. And if you're noticing, you know, I don't type the entire desktop, so I had Okay, so we're already in desktop. Do you see this? So I type, I, so I tap, this is called tab, tab completion. Many of the modern editors also have this facility, especially for programming languages. So I do CD test. And it's always, always very useful to tap complete because you might end up you know, writing something else. So we do an LS, 
we don't see uh, anything in temp so we go to temp uh, there's nothing we now let's use a simpler quick editor nano so it's again an editor i hope i have it installed yeah i do control o to write out control x to exit uh you see what command i used there cat is displaying the uh cat is showing me the contents of a file now let's go back we have some executables right what if i know what if i execute uh what if i try to display the contents of the executable so this is almost right like opening uh some some dot exe in notepad let's do <coughs> so do you understand what's happening do you see some playing cards and you might uh recognize some english stuff like gnu dot hash dot dynamic sim dot dynamic string dot gnu dot version dot gnu dot version underscore r dot tm clone table so this is the executable and this is some of it looks gibberish so usually not a very good idea to to look at the text of uh, of the executables okay so we were looking at ls minus r or minus recursive right ls minus r so i wrote ls minus r on the desktop i see the files in the desktop and then i see the files inside the temp folder <coughs> is everyone following along at this point of time <coughs> if i go back a folder and if i write ls minus r what do you expect to see now what do you expect to see so we'll see a folder for desktop and within that we'll see uh we see what all stuff exist within the desktop and then what exist in desktop temp and then documents downloads music pictures public templates videos so one common application of uh, ls which i have used a lot so i have different processes so i usually run some simulations or big python <coughs> programs uh so they are continuously running under the hood in the background and they're producing files so whenever a process is completed it creates a dot csv or a dot txt so to monitor the progress of execution of uh, the entire thing i count the number of files let's say if i have 50000 such simulations with different parameters so i and i and i'm dumping them all into a common directory let's say i'm dumping them into desktop temp now if i want to look at the progress of the execution one simple way is to look at ls count the number of files which exist divided by the total number of files i expect so let's say 40000 files uh, exist in that folder whereas the total simulation will produce 50000 so about uh, 80% of the task has completed so does anyone know how we can count the number of files okay so we talking about count so it has to do some the command has to have something like count in it or c in it the wc command
if you run this command wc on a file it shows you something something let's look at the output again prints the new line word and byte counts for each file so the first output is a new line the second is the number of words and the third is the byte count of each file <coughs> We could also, so if we do ls minus la, so if we just do a simple ls, what do we see? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8 and 8, 16, right? This is 32. If we just write ls, it and this is going to give us the total count of what we see. So, one fly in this is it's also showing me the folders. So we could modify the ls uh, arguments to show only the files and then do a word count uh, sorry yeah just run the wc on it and if you're wondering why we seeing 32 here so i think ls minus la is also showing you all the hidden directory hidden files also so if we do ls minus so this is more than 16 right so you see dot uh, this is a hidden backup i think these are some backup files which were created dot readme so we don't need to bother about these but in general we can see so another operation which we just saw in the previous command was if you remember from yesterday's lab so we are basically running ls and then the output of this is passed on to the next command so this is one thing which this is something which makes unix uh, or linux very special so you can pipe these uh, commands together Uh, so let's say you want to now search for some substring in in io.c using the command line. Uh, any idea of what command you want to use? So you want to find all the uh, do you want you want to find the number of times uh, int int occurs in this file? So how many integers are you using? So it shows of uh, so int occurs also in printf. So this is not an exact match, but again we could modify grep to to look at only the specific instantiations. Let's say we want to not do that. We could just do. So we get that we're using five uh, five different times int has been used in this file. So grep is actually a very useful command. So, so the basic thing is print lines matching a pattern. So in the previous thing we didn't actually match a pattern, but we could you know actually give a pattern using some of the regular expression commands or uh, regular expressions. So it says that it grep searches for pattern in each file. A file of the stands for standard input. And then we were running PS yesterday. We can do PS minus A. So we saw various other uh, arguments we could give to PS yesterday. Yeah, any other command or functionality you want me to demonstrate in the next three minutes before we wrap up what it is. If you're using an operating system, let's say Windows, uh, because you most of us are very familiar with it. Is there anything you typically would do in Windows that you want me to demonstrate? 
So one thing you do is some file operations, like you copy file from one location to another, or you move. So if you want to copy the files, the command is cp, copy. So I have io.c, let's say I want to move, or I want to copy io.c to the temp folder. So I give uh, the, the arguments to copy are the file you want to copy and then the destination. And now if you do an ls minus r, so you see the temp now also has a copy of io.c. And if you want to move instead of copying, so let's say I want to move temp header.txt to the current directory. So the current directory is represented by dot in terms of the relative uh, space. You, the previous directory or the parent directory is dot dot. So let's say I want to move to the uh, header.txt to the parent directory of desktop. So currently we're in desktop, right? So I do this. And if I do a CD and LS, so you see hello.txt there, right? So we've seen uh, move. So move means that file has actually been moved. So you don't see it any longer in the new, in the source folder. Yeah, anything else you want? Deleting. So delete, you delete a file using the rm command remove. Uh, let's say I want to delete hello.txt. I no longer have that. Now, deleting a folder is a slightly non-trivial process. So if the folder is empty, you could just uh, write rm minus r on the folder, but sometimes the folder does have, uh, you know, some content. So you actually need to remove all the files before, but you don't do it manually. So again, you could uh, look at different arguments with rm and you can remove, you can empty a folder also. And the famous joke with Unix is like to never run rf, rm minus rf on root. So that's, that's what most interns, like some interns end up doing and they end up destroying the entire file system. Because uh, you could, could actually recursively delete the entire file system if you're not careful with the rm command. So that is one of the reasons you've been handed a VM and not uh, like directly you're not running it on the system computers even though there is Linux there. Of course you also won't have the root privileges there. Okay, with this we'll end today's lecture.